Hello and welcome to How Mike UK. Today with me I have Russell Pollard, a photojournalist and prominent writer on Artach in Derby, UK. Hello, Mr. Pollard. Hi. Um, so I gave a really brief introduction, so I would like to hear more about yourself, uh, where you came from, your background, your occupation, and just a little bit more about you. Okay, well, I was um, born in Leicester in 1961, um, I guess a sort of fairly conventional upbringing, really, and um, studied finance initially, and that's where it, my first occupation, and then uh, moved to Rolls-Royce in Derby, which um, kept me there for 30 years. And so doing a variety of jobs there, project management and various other things. And, um, and it was, I guess, towards the end of that period when I was working that I uh, started travelling more and then subsequently came to Armenia and, you know, the rest is history sort of thing, I suppose. But, so that's broadly the background. So yeah. for, for a good part of my life, it was what I would call a conventional yeah. uh, arrangement. So you basically have no Armenian blood in you. What really prompted your interest in Armenia and the Armenian cause? Um, I guess it's, it's entirely by accident. So there was nothing premeditated. There was nothing that um, inspired me to do that. I mean, I would say that with or without Armenian blood, then people will obviously take to causes like, for example, people will with the Palestinian cause, but don't necessarily have any Palestinian blood. So. Um, I guess it was just over time as I was going out, and particularly the first visit, where I was beginning to realise that there were certain issues around Armenia, and particularly Nagorno-Karabakh, which triggered memories of being aware of the war. And, um, and unlike other countries where it felt difficult to um, get some sense of what was going on from a brief visit, in a, such a short visit, it was at that point I was inspired to then go back um, and particularly then going to Stepanakert and then meeting people and having lunch with people and then it became more of a personal issue rather than an academic and I think that that's probably the, the thread I would always say to people this is I don't have an academic interest in Armenia or the Armenian cause as such it stems from the fact that I know people know people very well mm -hmm. um, that uh, that, that's inspired me to do that. So speaking of your personal uh, kind of visits, could you describe your visits to Armenia and Artsakh, your impressions? I believe you've been over nearly 20 times, if I'm not mistaken, um, and your experiences each time, do they yeah. differ? Uh, well, they certainly differ. I mean, I'm not sure it's 20. I've lost count, actually. Um, <laughs> but it, they differ for, for pro probably the reasons that, that people might not think is that I don't go out each time with some form of fixed agenda. I don't have an objective. I'm not going to uh, interview this person, discuss that with, and so on. And particularly in the later years, because I know people uh, very, very closely, uh, what tends to be the case is that we just sort of say, I'll come out during that period. And then what happens is what happens. So, um, so, how has it developed, I suppose? It's just because I'm becoming part of a, a sort of family environment as much as anything. And enjoying, in a sort of curious kind of way, the, the routine and the mundane and, and actually feeling part of the community. And I think that gives me a perspective, perhaps which others don't get, um, particularly if you're principally a tourist and you, you spend a couple of days there because you go to the, the usual hot spots and then back home. And, 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 and a bit like if you toured London, you would enjoy the Buckingham Palace and, Tower and so on, and, but you haven't really understood what's going on there. Uh, so it's a sort of evolving position. Yeah. And the more I know, I suppose, the more it becomes, um, I would say, more difficult from the perspective of I understand more about what goes on there, whereas I think uh, a lot of people who visit have a, what I would call a romanticised view of Artsakh. And, um, and life's never really like that anyway. Yeah. Um, speaking of Artsakh in particular, um, what, what was your role in Artsakh? And you mentioned also talking about finding the reality of life in Artsakh. What do you believe the reality is in Artsakh? 
<laughs> what's the reality? Um, that's, that's a difficult one to answer, really, it, it philosophically, because I don't think there's a universal answer. It's a bit like what's life like in, here, in England, I suppose. I mean, it's clearly very difficult for people. Um, and, um, you know, as an unrecognised, and I, I guess now I'm talking about the way it was before the Second War. Um, so living in an unrecognised country is something which is bizarre, you know, even from the point of view of we've tried to do things on the internet and there's no drop down box. And then how do you kind of configure Nagorno Karabakh? Do you kind of have to say you're in Azerbaijan or you're in Armenia and then it doesn't quite work, those sorts of things. Um, so, um, I'm trying to remember what your question was. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what is the reality of Artsakh? So the reality is that uh, clearly people are short of money. There's, there's very little income, there's very few jobs. A lot of the um, investment comes from I guess principally diaspora, Russian diaspora people. Um, and it becomes, I would say, a very difficult situation from the point of view of making something of yourself. If you are of the young, you know, the younger sort of category, you're either going to go to university or at some point you might have to you sort of move to Armenia or, or outside. So I do I do feel for people who live there because it's a really quite unusual situation that's um, and so it creates I would say a lot of um, mental health issues that uh, probably go unrecognised as well and, and that probably leads to lots of other issues that they have. Um, speaking on a more uh, let's say positive note about Artach, um you mentioned I mean I quote you directly from one of your posts is that, <laughs> that Artach is far removed from the pre-judicial propaganda that exists around the flat fascinating place and its people what is the positive side that you've seen of the reality of Artach? Well I'd say the positive side is is that you you go and um, you feel safe I've, and I've said this to people the, the sort of irony almost is that and again, I'm going back to prior to the war, of course, but is that uh, people assume that it's a dangerous place to go to, and, and it's not a dangerous place to go to. Stepanakert it's is probably a safe place anywhere. Um, so you've got, I would say, it's safe. Um, you don't f feel intimidated. And for those people who are a bit unsure, they might think it's sort of bandit country, particularly the way it's described in the media over here, separatists and weird sort of pejorative terms, that actually, and I've always said to people, if I dropped you in the Stepanica, you'd feel quite at home. You know, lots of young people, people yeah. dressed exactly how we are, having fun and so on. And, and that's always been the most positive side for me, is that um, I've always felt um, welcomed, particularly, but quite safe and actually quite enjoyed the whole environment. Um, I mean, you focus a lot on um, removing the propaganda, and obviously the Azerbaijani propaganda says otherwise, since, since, like, from your description. What role do you think this plays? Obviously, like you already mentioned, that, you know, it's not as intimidating. Um, but alongside the truth, um, like, you chose, you didn't chose to remain. And so the, you focus a lot on removing the propaganda, and, you know, much is made on the Azerbaijani propaganda, and... Um, you, you already mentioned that, you know, that's far removed from the truth, but um, alongside the truth, there are people who still want to remain neutral. What made you not remain neutral and take the army inside, should I say, or visit Stefan Aguert? Um, well, I guess by virtue of the fact that's the first place I went to, and the chances of me then visiting Azerbaijan to be kind of neutral, I, I don't think actually existed. Okay. Not that I actually explored that, but by virtue of um, visiting, then clearly if you wanted to get a visa to Azerbaijan, then that may well not be possible. And certainly since I've got the blacklisted status, then that's, that clearly was never going to be possible. But in reality, I was never motivated to go because I... And I didn't feel as though I was taking sides necessarily. Um, it didn't feel to me that somehow I was force-fitting mm -hmm. um, a relationship with the people that were in Armenia or in Nagorno-Karabakh. So, again, it wasn't an active decision. I am mindful to the fact that there are always two sides to the story, and there are a lot of people who were in Azerbaijan who suffered as a result of, certainly in the first war. So, 
and again, that's down to people. The, the, the politics has caused all the problems, but there are a lot of people that have remain affected in, on both sides. Yeah, um, but obviously there's, you realise the consequences. You mentioned the blacklist, and I, I think you mentioned once that it's an honour to be on the blacklist. Yes. Why, why so? Um, well, like a lot of things in life, if people actually are not terribly interested, if they're indifferent to what you're doing, then that's actually quite a negative thing. So to actually have the Azerbaijani Foreign Office saying that we're particularly concerned about what you're doing, we're going to blacklist you, then that to some extent is um, a, a, a compliment, bizarrely. But the other, the other thing as well, I would say, is that um, obviously coming from the UK, then people in uh, Artsakh, or Armenia for that matter, might question my motivations because the UK is very close to Azerbaijan, so are you on the cover or something? And, and so when I'm introduced many times there, I say, well, actually, um, he has been blacklisted, then that gives me some credibility and legitimacy, which um, has always proven to be particularly helpful, particularly when it's with uh, government people or military people, in, or people who are slightly sceptical. Um, I mean, you mentioned the UK government, but you were prominent, you had a prominent role in getting Derby City Council to recognise Artah. How did, how did you go about that? I asked them to. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say that it was, you know, from years and years of battering people's doors down and so on. But in terms of the, the, the recognition of the independence of Artsakh, I wrote to the four lead political leaders there and asked them, would they recognise the independence of Artsakh? Transaction, and that's what it was. And, and the process then is that they put together a motion and then that's taken through full council. Now, the reality is, is that because I know those people, they know my backgrounds from not only this work, but probably more so from the work I do in Derby. Um, and so I guess you'd have to ask them as to why they just responded directly to it. But they could see that it flowed naturally from the previous motion, which was to recognise the Armenian Genocide. And yeah. that was how I kind of framed it to some extent. Yeah, I mean, that was also one part of my... One of the questions I wanted to ask to move on to the Armenian Genocide and again how that came about. Um, would you say that you know without the direct links it's not possible to get the attention of the UK government at all or, or local government? Um, well there's no direct links in Derby. I mean one of the things I'm in a sense I guess proud of is the fact that there are no votes in doing this for Derby City Council. I mean there may be one or two Armenians in the city but fundamentally there is no political value to Derby City Council. So, so they took it on the, on the argument. Um, and the other sort of helping hand was that I'm part of the Holocaust Memorial Day group, which normally concentrates primarily on the Nazi Holocaust and beyond. And when I joined in 2014, um, I joined on the basis that we were going to talk about the gen Armenian genocide. And we did that starting in 2015. So the timing was quite nice. But also, quite importantly, at that point, um, because we publicised the agenda, the kind of presentations and things, and the day before I was due to, to speak, the Turkish government, the embassy in London, wrote to the mayor of Derby, basically saying, you shouldn't talk, be talking about it. You need to remove this from your um, presentation. And we, clearly we said no. Um, and whilst initially I was kind of slightly annoyed, during the course of that day, I thought, well, actually, this has really, been really helpful. Because then when I speak to, it was about 200 people who were, you know, just Derby regulars. And you could say, this isn't a, a presentation here about history. This is about now. And why do you think the Turkish government have written to the mayor of Derby in 2015 and made that statement? That's why it's so important today. And I always then linked it with Artsakh because I thought that was, that was really the, my ultimate objective. Yeah. So they did us a favour in reality. But I guess where I'm getting to with that is that has stuck with people in Derby City Council and that's why they then, I guess, part contributed to why they felt that they wanted to do it. Yeah. I mean, we're now in 2021, unfortunately, and the British government fails to recognise the Armenian Genocide or take particular action to, for Artsakh. What strategies do you believe that the UK Armenian community or the diaspora can take to get like, their voice heard, even on local level, to such authority? Um, 
That's a good question. That's a good question. I mean, I don't think the UK government will ever recognise the Yemen genocide. There's no reason to do so. Um, so you either try and continue to push water uphill or you accept that's not going to be the case. Um, but possibly, uh, rather than thinking, well, the only form of recognition is a local authority doing that, why not be working through individuals to do that recognition? And that was my, always my view to people was, yes, we can't recognise Artsakh, or at the time we couldn't, um, but you can do it personally by visiting. And I would say to anybody who gets really troubled by local authorities or governments not doing things, well, you can, and you can do it. You can go to Artsakh, and, and every, one, every one person that goes is part of that recognition process. Who cares whether a particular local authority does it? It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. Um, that, that's really interesting, actually. Um, sorry. Uh, I think just kind of like going back to the uh, the recent war and your. I think were you there during the four day no. war? Well, not the four day war, nor the the forty four day. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but just what what are your reflections, regardless, on the recent wars and you know the alongside everything? What do you think? You know, you describe, uh, you know, as such the, the strong and the safety of Artsakh, but what do you think made Armenia face such great loss during the recent wars? Um, terrific firepower from Azerbaijan and Turkey. I mean, in, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to win a war where your um, budget for, for military equipment is, is completely minuscule compared to that of the people that you're fighting against. I don't think there was any, ever any chance of, of the Armenians ever winning. And I say that with the benefit of hindsight. I think probably what a lot of people are going to be struggling with is the fact that they actually felt that that was a possibility. And that, and I think this is a, an issue for a lot of Armenians, is that they kind of almost believe their own PR. Um, and that the centuries hero heroism of Armenian soldiers will battle against this that and the other and it's like well not if they've got firepower that won't be the case so I, I imagine there's a lot of soul searching and um, I imagine it's like a, a feeling of grief I mean I certain I certainly feel that myself you know the idea that somehow she she is not in the in its original states that 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 you would drive past it and there'll be a Ziri flags and that somebody can't visit and so on. And that's from me who's just a kind of casual visitor, as, as opposed to people who, who, who live there. And, and, and I know that because I've spoken to my friends who live there. That sense of loss that you're looking up there and you can't access it. Um, but the sad thing is, is that the, you know, the communications were flawed. You know, I, and I think uh, the people who were listening to everything were, were given a false sense of security, a false sense of hope that that, um, that they were ever going to win. And that's the sort of disappointing part about it, really. And I think that's why, come the day when all of a sudden she had gone, people thought, well, how did that happen? Because surely I thought we were, you know, ch -ch -ch -ch. And, and, and all that movement of forces and things had really been kind of glossed over. And then all of a sudden it had gone. And I think that it started that whole kind of movement of, well, I guess really a yeah, sense of loss, really, that, that wasn't what we were expecting. Do you think if we actually understood the clear reality of the situation, it would have, do you think, do you not think it could have had a much more negative effect where it would have brought the extreme disappointment rather than fight for 44 days and try to try to prove your point somehow? I'm not sure how you mean. You mean before the war that it had a... No, just in general, if we had a sense of secure, if, if, if we had a, a good reality of the situation. Yeah. Do you think it would have caused a like a, a counter effect of like more negativity and just a sense of like... I don't, I don't know. I mean, the thing I always struggle with is when I uh, talk to people over the years and they say, well, how is all this going to resolve itself? And nobody ever um, had any ideas about compromise. So you've got a situation with the, you know, the territories around the outside, again, as was, and that, yes, we want a negotiated agreement, it involves us not changing anything. 
well, that's not a negotiation where you don't change anything. And now all those discussions may well have been going on in the background somewhere, but for, for, for the individuals on the grounds, everybody was without compromise. We will not move an inch. And frankly, that was never going to be the long-term solution. I, I would have fought myself for that to be the long-term solution. But, you know, in the kind of back of your mind, you're thinking, I don't understand how that's going to be negotiated as a settlement where nothing changes. That's not compromise. Yeah. Um, I mean, now we're on this compromise stage, I would say. We're on this peace building, and we, at least we're trying to, to have this peace agreement. And again, I think you wrote once that peace building is about people, not politics. Mm. Um, what do you mean, what can the people do? If it's embedded in their identity, um, what can the people do? Well, uh, you mean the people over there or the people over here? Likewise, both places. I mean, the second question was actually, what can the international community do with the diaspora? But Visit. <laughs> Honestly. Because everything else is too complicated. And, and the reality is, is that nothing more substantial is going to happen. What we don't need is lots more organisations that are peace-building organisations. Because I've come across those, I've spoken to them. It's just a, a sump for somebody else's money. Um, if each member of the Armenian community, whatever that means, internationally, made a commitment, like Muslims would to go to Mecca, for example, that type of thing, say, I might not go for a year, but if I go at least once, that's however many millions of people that will go. And it will give a credence to the place that at the moment is, is on its knees, because nobody quite knows whether this sort of rump of what was Artsakh that I last visited, um, how that's, what, what the long-term solution is or position is for that, because having a corridor managed by Russians clearly isn't the long-term solution. So my answer always would be, go and visit. Um, would you suggest, though, I mean, obviously that's a one-man one -man game to visit and then we build up on, on those, but do you think there's a political strategy that the diaspora in particular can take? Well, I'm not sure who the diaspora is, if I'm honest. I mean, I, I would take yeah. issue, and I think this is one of the big, one of the, the problems with the community, because I don't think it exists as such, I think it's a, it's a bit of a fiction. The Armenian diaspora is, is, is what, is, who is it? There is no cohesion within a diaspora to then say, I mean, I know there are big groups, clearly an Anchor and so on, but fundamentally there isn't a, a cohesion between the, the Armenian diaspora. So I don't know who you would be talking to. Um, but I just think people talking at institutional level, it's clearly not worked. It has never worked. So that is the sort of definition of madness, isn't it? To continue doing the thing you know doesn't work. Um, so I would advocate people thinking more creatively. And I think what we'll call pejoratively keyboard warriors in America or anywhere for that matter, pontificating about what should or shouldn't happen over there, I don't think is particularly helpful. I don't think it's achieved anything. Yeah. If, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I mean, clearly there's lots of fundraising and lots of infrastructure work that's been done as a result of that, and that's all fantastic stuff. But again, it, that wasn't successful. And I think that's what people need to do, say, the, the war took place for a reason, the, the outcome of that happened for a reason, it wasn't improved or affected by the fact that there were a lot of people on Facebook. Yeah. And speaking actually of the diaspora, um, I know you visited the Armenian Summer Festival uh, a few times. What are your impressions of, did you see a collective community there? Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I'm always mindful that, you know, I dipped in for a couple of hours and then went. So on the face of it, you've got a group of people who share the same interest in food or dancing or what have you. Um, and that's great for people who are within that cultural grouping to, to enjoy that in London. That's all good stuff. And that's kind of where I'd leave it, I suppose. Okay. I'm not sure whether it, there's nothing, I don't feel there's anything beyond that, but I don't think there needs to be anything beyond that necessarily. Um, well, do you have any final thoughts that you would wish to present? Um, I would, I, would, I would strongly request, for what it's worth, that the Armenian community, the Armenian diaspora, whoever that is, 
tries and moves away from being fixated entirely on the Armenian genocide as an entity in itself. Um, I, th I, just, I just don't think that's helpful. I say, and, I, 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 and I'm saying this from, from what I felt was right and what I did, which is it's a good starting position from having a conversation that leads people to understand the situation today. And, and, and that sort of thesis that what's, that's what's happening today is an unfinished genocide from a moment years ago. If the concentration is we want Turkey to recognise the genocide, and that's the end of it, or even worse, I know some people then want to then, um, recover land, reparations and so on. I just feel that that's going off down here. It's never going to happen. It's a fantasy land. It won't help the individuals. It won't help people. People in Artsakh will not help them at all. So why not concentrate efforts on things that will help people today in Artsakh positively and not just, we want you to recognise the genocide. And if you do, then what? What happens then? Because I don't think, it's a bit like, dare I say, it's a bit like a dog catching up, catching up with a bus. It doesn't know what to do when it's got there. Because it just doesn't achieve anything. Because yeah. it won't change anything. And Turkey will not recognise. And, and that's what I would really wish that people would do, is change the strategy. Because it's not working. Um, I think you mentioned visiting. What other positive steps do you suggest to take in, to, in order to change that strategy? Um, talking about it, but talking about it in a way that's relevant to the people you're talking to. Um, I mean, there's a difference where you've got Armenians talking to Armenians, and it's, it's kind of an echo chamber. And but talking to other people, I mean. In my own little way, you know, people know what I do when I go to the pub. So when I go to the pub in November or September-ish, people saying, oh, I read, read in the paper about... And they can never say it, you know, not go on camera. And so they understand, they know what's happening. Now, that's a little part of it. And a lot of people I've worked with or people, various people in Dublin would be aware of it by virtue of that. So that's one person. Um, they probably won't know much about the Armenian genocide because it's not relevant to them. But that is relevant, and they see it in the paper, and they, they see it on the TV. Well, what about if everybody else was doing that to people who are not necessarily that interested, and get them interested? Uh, whether that achieves anything, I don't really know. Um, but it can't help. Oh, so it can't not help, rather. Um, I mean, one of the f sayings I heard right from the outset, which, I, which kind of worked for me, was I can't. I can't do everything, but I must not do nothing, or words to that effect. In other words, it doesn't matter how small a thing you do, because you're not going to solve world peace, so you might as well do something. And that's why I still maintain visiting, taking your money, and not doing what a lot of people do, is then knock down the prices over there, which is what happens from Europeans and various other people. They will negotiate prices down, and I said, no, 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 you got the money. You pay the full rate for the taxi, for the tour guide, and so on. Um, and bring the money into the country so it has some form of e economy beyond... Um, you know, it can't manufacture things, it can't sell things. So that's the, the tourism is its biggest opportunity. But people won't go because it's a six-hour drive or the toilets aren't very nice or something. It's like, you know, come on, guys. You're either serious about this or you're not. Yeah. And that would be my challenge to people. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for having the conversation with me today. I mean, I guess that's another positive step from our side. Yeah. Um, so, and well, thanks thank for you. asking me. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for listening. And thank you to all who joined us on Hamaik UK. Um, we'll see you next time.